Well, good evening. It's really, I'm excited to be here. I was saying to somebody, you know, I'm not really much of the history. And then they said, well, 50 years is probably quite a bit of history. So uh, go do whatever your, th your thing is all about. Well, I want to take you sort of back to uh, the very beginning in 1964 when uh, the Vail family sold this project, 87,500 acres, to three major corporations. The Pennsylvania Railroad had a subsidiary called MACO. Kaiser Industry and Kaiser Steel. And the three gentlemen that worked for Maco Realty, Hugh Blue, Jim Marar, and Hal Lynch, came up with a concept that uh, was just, has set the stage for this valley that has made it one of the most unique places possibly you could have in, in Southern California. And it's what brought me here. They made the idea that they were going to take this 87,500 acres and set aside 80% of it for country, for open space, for, for citrus, for avocados, for horse countries, whatever. And they were going to concentrate 20% of it, which is, you know, 17,000 acres, which is a pretty big area in itself. And that's where the high density was going to be. Back then, it was right along Interstate uh, 395, which we now know as Interstate 15. That's where the industrial, the commercial, uh, and, and the mass of the homes were, were going to come in. Great concept. How could they do it? They could do it because back in 1964, they paid $200 an acre. And so to set aside a lot of that land wasn't a major fee. And they could also make a lot more money by concentrating right along the, the 395 Inters Highway than they could by trying to develop the entire project. And they sold 6,000 acres to Atlantic Ridgefield, which helped fund their acquisition. And they sold 6,000 acres to Boise Cascade to help fund it. So that's how this basic program started, how this master plan community came about and how things started. I guess looking back, they were genius in what they did. The one thing that they probably made a mistake as we look back in history is they thought they did a great job creating a road system that would handle the growth. <laughs> And as we've all found out, uh, it just wasn't as much as it, it, it could have been. But uh, as we put postage stamps together, we keep solving these problems one at a time as we go through. In 1968, I was a banker. I was uh, getting my master's degree at the University of Southern California, fellow Trojan <laughs> back there, Bob. Um, and uh, we had a guest speaker one of my real estate classes. I can't remember his first name. His last name was Olson. And he said something that resonated to me, even though he was speaking to a couple hundred people in the class itself. And he said, when he was talking demographics, that 90% of all the people in the world live within 25 miles of the ocean. And then he also said that in our lifetime, when we were all in our young 20s, in our lifetime, between LA and San Diego, eventually it's going to grow together and it's going to be a solid megalopolis. Now, I think I might have been the only guy listening. I don't know. And maybe the reason I was listening is because I moved to the San Fernando Valley when I was nine years old in 1953, and I was shooting rabbits as a nine-year-old uh, on my front porch. There was literally country. There was no freeways. There was no apartment houses. There was no smog. Uh, there was country. And I watched it over the next 10 years, see apartment houses and freeways and traffic jams, and you name it, happen. And then about night, when I was about 19 years old, my dad bought a little industrial building in the middle of nowhere, about three miles north of then the Santa Ana Airport, in a, an area that wasn't even Irvine at the time. And you could stand on the front porch of his little 6,000 square foot of industrial building, and other than the two buildings right next to him, which were also 6,000 uh, square feet, uh, about a half a mile away, you could see the sugar beet, the Holly Sugar Beet Factory, Right there on what's now known as Dyer Road in 55. Other than that, was solid agriculture. And then over the next 10 years, you watched Irvine created and you watched one of the most dynamic industrial residential developments that we've seen in this country. So when I came out here in uh, 1968 and decided to buy some land, I had accumulated $4,500 and I figured, wow, this place makes sense. It's between LA and San Diego, uh, it's within 50 miles of the, or 25 miles of the coast. And you've got these major giant corporations that were going to make things happen that it would otherwise happen without their input and without their money. So I bought land out here. Again, I was a banker at the time. Figured 50 years from now, that little 12 acres I bought would be worth enough money for me to retire. And as a banker, that's sort of what you thought. What are you going to do when you're ready to get ready to retire? 
It's not how you think as a developer, and I'll share some of those stories as we, we come about. Anyway, as luck would have it, I decided to make a change in 1969. I went out and looked in the financial markets. I uh, ended up getting hired by Cobalt Banker as the finance director. At that time, Cobalt Banker had all the exclusive marketing rights for the Rancho California project that was owned by, by Kaiser Industries and Kaiser Steel. So they hired me to basically handle the financial transition between this particular division out here and Cobalt Banker, which was an L.A. firm. And back then, we see Cobalt Banker everywhere right now. 95% of 99% of what you see is residential. Back then, they did no residential. It was just all industrial, commercial, and they were the largest in the, in the country in doing that. And they decided to create a land division where they were going to start representing large landowners and, and doing master plan communities, such as what Rancho California was all about. So I had a lot of fun doing that. I was making a big giant salary of I think about $6,500 a year. Didn't know how to spend all that amount of money. But back then that was a decent amount of money to live on. Um, did that for about six months. Um, decided that I want, want to jump into the real estate side of it for one simple reason. Guys were making in a month what I was making in a year and I was working a lot more hours than they were. So I got involved as a salesman in 1970 for Cobalt Banker. Uh, that particular year, and I started putting a couple partnerships together. And I was politely told about December of that, late, that year by the, uh, the president of uh, that organization that they didn't want me to do partnerships. That was against their philosophy. And I thought about it for a day or so, and I said, well, I think what I'm going to do is start my own company. And it just so happened that year I was their top salesman out of 60 salesmen they had. Next day they decided, well, maybe putting partnership together wasn't <laughs> all that bad, but I'd made the decision to leave, and uh, so I left that organization, started, back then it was called Rancho Consultants, strictly for the purpose of buying land, developing it. Back then developing was getting just civil engineers like this gentleman right here, breaking big pieces of property into smaller pieces of property and selling it. And I had the basic concept, no different than the grocery store market guy that said, you buy a truckload of bread at one price, wholesale, you sell them one loaf at a time. Well, I was buying 300 acres, in some cases 1,000 acres, at a 1,000 acre or 300 acre price, wholesale. I'd break them into a bunch of 20s. Back then, you could do it in literally three or four months. Now it takes three or four years. Back then, you could do it for hundreds of dollars. Now it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. But back then it was a great formula. I'd put together, oh my gosh, probably 300 different syndicates where they bought 20 acres at our 300 acre wholesale price. And then each one of these little 20s would then break them into four or fives and they sell them at the price of a five. So we were buying stuff at a thousand an acre. And within a year they broke it into fives and a five acre parcel was worth 5,000 an acre. Literally you could create five times the value in about a year and a half of doing it. It was a, a great formula until they changed the laws and wouldn't let us do that anymore. A lot of fun during the time, though. Um, 1972, land was getting, uh, was, was, was booming. But, you know, who, when you came out here and you left Newport Beach, what's the first thing you lost? You lost your tie and your suit and your shiny black shoes and you put on cowboy boots, had a cowboy shirt and a cowboy hat, and your wife would go get her hair done while people were walking or drive riding their horses back and forth. So it was really a fun time to do that. So what does every young man want to be? He wants to be a cattle baron. So we decided, uh, we found the ideal guy, obviously was a cowboy, and his name was Slim. All great cowboys are named Slim. <laughs> Last name was Hart. So Slim Hart had a bunch of strings of horses out here. He supplied them to a lot of the different groups that did horse rides uh, uh, out here. There was the Rancho California Caballeros, and they have them all over the, the country, but he supplied horses here. And so he talked us into buying 10 head of cattle. Sure enough, we doubled our money in six months like any fool. We rushed in, and so then we bought 50 head of cattle, and uh, somehow we realized that we're like, you remember all those cowboy movies where you had the sheep herders that would come in and the old cattle guys didn't yeah. want them and they were the bad guys? Yeah. Well, we were the bad guys. <laughs> so it just so happened, our little hundred head of cattle, this gate that we had just happened to get opened up one day. All of our cattle just happened to all go down in this territory where Leo Ropa had her lease on it. And the constable just happened to be there when all of our uh, cattle showed up. 
Anyway, uh, we decided that uh, we were, we'd watched enough cowboy movies that we were not going to fight with the Ropal family and got out of the cattle business. I think we sold our cattle for half what we paid for it, doubled our money on 10, got half our money back on 100, decided we'd better go back to the land development. But funny story, true story, but uh, off we go. Um, started doing uh, uh, avocado ranches, the, the developer back then, Kaiser Industry, Kaiser Steel, and the Pennsylvania Railroad. Pennsylvania Railroad was having some financial challenges. They ended up selling their holdings to Aetna Life Insurance Company. So in 1969, Aetna joined with Kaiser Industry, Kaiser Steel, became a 50% partner, and they had lots of money. And so one of the things they decided to do was to plant avocados out here, back on the Duluth area, again, keeping this country community concept alive. And uh, they were, they were, planting these avocados and selling them for $6,500 an acre, fully planted. And so uh, we had the brainstorm of, wow, why don't we put some partnerships to buy them? They were giving us 90% financing on, on, a, on a purchase, and then they would lend us another 35% over the next three years to pay for all of our cultural costs. Well, back before 1976, if you invested a dollar and you, and you could write off any cultural costs, so if I planted it, if I watered it, if I put fertilizer on that was tax deductible. In 1976, the laws changed where you had to capitalize that. But the bottom line, since we were 125% leverage with our 10% down and then borrowing another 35%, uh, we were able to get someone that would put a dollar in our investment or whatever, and they would get a $3 write-off. Uh, those of you who remember, in 1973-74, we were like in a 70% tax bracket. So if you were a doctor making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, you were paying Uncle Sam 70% of it. So it was ridiculous. So we put these old avocado groves together, not having any idea to how to farm, how to manage them, how to do anything. Next thing you know, we had 5,000 acres of avocados under management, <laughs> largest avocado grow in the world. And uh, the sad part about it is the value of the land tripled. And uh, all of a sudden, the price of avocados went up like fourfold. So we were like the whiz kids until all of a sudden all land went down and a half and the price of avocados went down. The good news is we made everybody a little bit of money. We didn't make them a fortune like we thought we were, but we did preserve their 300% write-off, and that was 99% the reason they invested them anyway. So uh, that was a fun time in our life when we did that from about 1973 to about 1981 when we liquidated all the avocados out there. And we were extremely involved in Calavo and the California Avocado Advisory Board and what have you. So that was a fun part of, of the business itself. In 1972, um, again, as I said, we had been doing an awful lot of these large purchases and, and breaking them down into smaller parcels. A gentleman named Clark Beaumont walked in our office, and who was a sales manager for Boise Cascade. They bought 6,000 acres. They turned it into a project called La Cresta, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, and uh, sold it. Literally, they sold all 6,000 acres in like 320-acre parcels in two weekends. Tremendous marketing organization. And what frustrated me is they were selling them for 2,000 an acre, and I was selling land right next to it and buying land and putting parts together at 1,000 an acre. So I said, wow, how can they sell it for that much? I guess the answer was I was doing 300 acres and they were selling 20 acres, so they just used my same concept and philosophy. Anyway, what, what, but what uh, Boise did not do that uh, I'm happy to say we've always done is, uh, is one thing selling, it's the other thing servicing. You gotta service what you sell, you gotta maintain, you gotta take care of it, you gotta have homeowners associations in most cases. Um, so what happened is about 15 of the parcels that Boise had sold came back into foreclosure Clark Bowman came into our office, introduced himself, and said, hey, I think we can buy these 15 parcels for like 40 cents on the dollar. So if they sold them for 2,000 an acre, we could buy them for, uh, you know, 400, uh, uh, $20, excuse me, uh, $800. So we could buy it for 40 cents on what they sold it for. What the condition is we couldn't sell it for less than the two grand because they didn't want, to, uh, want us to undermine the prices. So we entered into the contract. Boise had a clause in there uh, that said if we get any more back in, in foreclosure, you are required to buy them. Uh, thank heavens I had an attorney smarter than me. He said, fine, we'll agree to do that, but you can only give us maximum four parcels in a month. We never thought we'd get any more back. 
Several years later, Boise lost a, a major, major class action lawsuit on a, like they did a hundred of these projects around the country and had to offer a right of rescission, which means anybody could get their money back if they just fill out the paper and went and sent it back to Boise. Next thing you know, they got 4,000 acres back. By then, we had already got a homeowners association. We built a couple spec houses, planted some citrus, planted some avocados, planted some vineyards, got a community sort of starting. So the value of the land was no longer worth 2,000. It was now worth 4,000. We were still buying at 800 an acre. Um, we were selling that. We were trading for trees, cowboy boots. <laughs> washing machines, you name it. If you wanted to buy a lot and you had something you wanted to trade, we trade in. We were selling for very little down, taking long-term notes, so the income from that note kept us going for a long period of time. And uh, I go up to La Cresta right now. We end up building about 23 houses up there over the years, including uh, my part of the time, Tom Leavers and I built two of our own homes right in that general area. Extremely proud of that area. Homes are beautiful, the community's beautiful, yeah. it's everything you dreamed it would be. Um, did a lot of horse trails back up in there, especially in La Cresta Highlands and Santa Rosa West, uh, and have uh, got a community that will be country forever because it's it's yeah. set in stone and the way it's subdivided it is do that, so really proud of that. I wasn't going to tell the story about Dick Gibble, but I will because we've got a gentleman that brought up his name. Uh, Dick Gibble was a cousin of mine, 10 years my senior. We both graduated from college, and as we are getting plastered at our graduation party, which you did when you graduated at that age, we said, Dick said, you know, when I'm wealthy, I'm going to invest my money with you. And I said, well, if I ever build a house, I'm going to let you build it. <laughs> anyway, seven, eight years later, Dick Gibble, who was very creative, uh, is working for the federal government building Quonset House. Um, and that is anything, that, what, what he wanted to do is he's getting his degree from Cal in, in architecture. Anyway, so I called him up and said, Dick, I bought this 28 acres out in Santa Rosa West, and I really want to build a house out here, and I want you to design it. But I want a family discount, obviously. And he says, I'd love to do that. And I said, great. So he came out for the weekend, looked at the land. I'd say over the next six months, he took about three trips out here, Started to work on the design of this particular house, and it was a 10,000 square foot house right on the plateau over all of the now 10,000 acre reserve. Back then, it was owned by Kaiser Etna, and it was on my backyard on my play. I go hunting deers and riding motorcycles and doing everything else. It was, it was terrific. Anyway, after about the fourth visit out here over a six month period, Dick Kibble went home and looked at his wife, Ann, and said, Ann, I'm quitting my job tomorrow. I'm moving to Temecula. I just remember why I became an architect. And he worked with this gentleman here doing civil engineering. And as time went on, and the old town of Temecula created a historical society because they wanted new buildings to be more the Western theme. Dick was the architect. We ended up doing uh, three buildings out, three buildings out in old town at the time, uh, all along. With, what we think was Western at that point in time. Bob Morrison was part of our, our team in doing that and, and had a little bit of the foundation of trying to preserve the old town and old town Temecula and was really excited to, to do that. Um, started by, by this, this property that Dick came out, uh, uh, bought it in 1977. Um, I decided I wanted to, you know, if you're a cowboy and you want to have horses and cattle, you got to have a fence. So I was going to put this really beautiful three-wheel right fence all around my 28 acres. And local gentleman here uh, uh, named Tom Moore, his dad owned a uh, 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 no, called Cal Moore that built uh, barns, of which I traded a La Crest a lot for one of his barns, now that I think about it. But also, Tom realized that I wanted to give him a bid on building this three-rail white fence. So Tom said, Dan, it's gonna give me a bid of 17 grand, but he says, you got a lot of rock. Back then, you had a lot of Mexican labor that was back then, I can't remember, 50 cents or 75 cents an hour, but not very much. I can build you a rock wall like the rock of China, like China, <laughs> the wall of China, for the same price. And so, I said, that's a good idea. <laughs> $250,000 later, we finished this $17,000 rock wall that only had mortar in it at the archway. Nowhere else. It's still standing. It's absolutely magnificent and uh, raised my family up 
in that uh, that part of the world. Do they still call it Rancho de Sueños? Do I what? Do they still call yeah, it? Yeah, they still call it Rancho de Sueños, yeah. so yeah. Rancho of Dreams, uh, translated into English. The name of the street getting there, because I named all the streets, was uh, <laughs> you know, Camino de Sueños. So uh, we had a lot of fun raising the kids there, riding motorcycles, uh, and doing whatever you could do up there when nobody cared. So it was fun. But uh, that was uh, that was the Dick Gibble story. So it's fun. Um, and we built, uh, well, like well, some of the buildings he designed, now it's Texas-like, no, it's exactly as Western um, Mad Madelines. And by the way, Mad Madelines originally was a hamburger stand that was run by uh, uh, Melinda, uh, now Marciano, back then Melinda Diaz. She just got awarded about a month and a half ago this uh, Citizen of the Year for the Boy Scouts of America. So she's been here forever. She was our original tenant on that. Oh, uh, if you remember Mass. Uh, uh, Mascola's the homestead. Um, you remember the homestead back on the plaza, also known as the home wrecker. Um, she, her husband owned that, so she was our first tenant in what was called Mascola's, which is a little Italian restaurant. And then we built that little building just north of it, that two-story nice little building. And then we built Rancon Plaza right there in, uh, on Front Street. Interesting story, Rancon Plaza, I'm a ski nut. I was up in Park City and I get a phone call about 6 o'clock in the morning from another old timer that unfortunately has passed away, Kevin Walsh. Kevin ended up being the, the mayor of Temecula, or excuse me, Marietta for a period of time. But in this particular morning at six o'clock, the phone rings and Kevin says, Dan, if you got $50,000, I can tie up the entire city block in downtown Temecula. We can buy this, this, this complex for $175,000. Of which I said, wow, that sounds like a good deal. So we ended up buying it. Uh, that was the old bank there. It was the old brothel from back um, many decades or centuries ago. And uh, so we tore everything down by the bank, built the Rancon Plaza, kept that little vault. And so that vault was part of my office for a lot of years. And um, we, we built that complex. I wish I had kept it, but back then, only trying to lease property in Temecula wasn't easy. Now they're standing in line 10 deep. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, 1981. Um, we teamed up with Jack Nicholas, one of my real estate agents, Bill Dixon, had gone to college with Jack Nicholas in Michigan, uh, brought Jack out here. He wanted to build a world-class golf course. This is when he was just getting started uh, building golf courses. Uh, um, you know, again, I, to, a, to a NIMBY or people that says, I don't want any growth out here, i am always been the bad guy because they don't want to see Bear Creeks. They don't want to see anything. And I respect that and I understand that. And to some degree, I'm, I'm that way. Uh, on, on property that uh, I, I feel is zoned for that, both general plan, specific plan. But if it's zoned for something different than that, then, then we tend to get at odds with those people that don't want us to. And a lot of the people in Murrieta didn't want anything out there. Um, it was going to happen no matter what. It was a matter of time. Um, but if it was going to happen, let's do something nice. And Jack Nicholas wanted to come out here and build a world-class golf course. So we, uh, we uh, helped him put the partnership together. We were one of his original finder, founders with President Ford and a bunch of other uh, dignitaries around the country. There were 34 of us. I remember when we went to the county to uh, go to the hearing to get a final vote on it. And uh, uh, one of the, uh, the people that were against the project sort of stood up and yelled as loud as he could yell, we can't find a seat because Mr. Stevenson's filled them with all of his employees. And uh, I did. <laughs> so, anyway, I wasn't there to lose, and we got it approved. And uh, as, as the area has grown, if you want development, you want it done quality, that certainly is a good example of that. If you don't want development, no matter what the quality is, then I'm probably on the wrong side of the fence with you. But uh, I respect your position, and I hope you respect mine in that regard. But very proud of Bear Creek. Uh, Lived there for about 15 years, just sold it, and I'm building a house uh, in wine country again. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting that done. I'm actually going to build a, something I haven't done before. I'm going to build a farm. So I'm going to have my chickens and my vineyards and my orchards and, and a farmhouse and um, uh, get, back to the, get back to the grounds. It's going to be the last house I build. I built enough of them. Um, then in 1982, we switched from doing a lot of land and a lot of agriculture, and we started doing development. Uh, so we bought uh, originally 90 acres uh, right there on Jefferson Avenue in Montezuma, if you know where that is. Just uh, uh, And we master planned this 
industrial commercial park. I mean, when we did the open house and invited people to look at it, you needed binoculars to see another building out there. So, uh, I mean, I literally was the Pied Piper to get convinced people that this place was going to happen. And uh, they listened to the music, they invested in it, and it got built. And, and uh, uh, with, again, I think we built a really nice quality project. Certainly got the industrial base going out here uh, as a result of, of that being a project. Uh, then in 84, we bought the uh, a bunch of property that include the old Adobe Plaza. I've, I've really not, I haven't tried. I have absolutely protected uh, um, what is out here historical. And there was the old Adobe Plaza, the oldest house in Marietta. So we sort of made that the focal point. We kept it built around it at some great expense, called the, 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 the project Old Adobe Plaza. Built it uh, um, right down the street from that. We built the Stater Brothers, which was called... Uh, um, oops, I forgot the name all of a sudden. I'll think about it in a minute. Uh, Winchester Square, which was the first supermarket uh, here in town, the first movie theater. That was fun doing it. Um, we did that. 1986, uh, we, we bought the Alta Murrieta, which was a, a huge project right there on Murrieta Hot Springs Road, now 215. Back then it was all 395, and built the first master plan community out here. Um, where we had parks and commercial as well as residential. And what I'm most proud about that, because um, I've always, as a company, and both me and everybody in the company, or most everybody in the company, we really encourage them to be involved, get back to the community, you know, be involved in the chambers, do different things, which they've all done it. Well, a lot of us put a lot of time, money, and energy in building the first community park over there on, on, uh, in Temecula. But there was no way to fund community parks, and so we, we didn't have but one park in all of the, the greater Temecula area. So I remember I went down and met with Walt Abrahams, who was our supervisor at the time, and um, I said, Walt, we need to create a, some vehicle so the county or some agency could maintain these parks. We can get developers like me to build them. We just can't maintain them for the rest of our lives because there's no money in doing that. And I remember Walt saying, I'm not going to tax the people. And I says, I'm not leaving here until you do this. And we arm wrestled a little bit. And God bless Walt Abrahams. He agreed to do it. And now Temecula Marietta is, uh, is housed with probably the best park systems uh, that you can have. But uh, And then one of the parks we built, I laughed. Uh, I decided I was, there was only two baseball teams, little, little league baseball teams, Temecula and Marietta, obviously. And I was umpiring one time. And um, I I was not a professional umpire. I was doing the best I could do. In hindsight, it wasn't that good, but uh, it was the best I could do. And this one guy that was the coach for the Temecula team um, uh, kept bad-mouthing my calls. So after a couple innings, I walked over to him politely. I said, you know what? I'm just doing the best I can do. I'm not getting paid to do this, but you're sure setting a bad example for the kids on this team and that team. So, so lighten up a little bit. Next inning, he's bad-mouthing me again, so I go over and I kick him out of the game. <laughs> Next inning, this president of the league shows up. Now, this is a league of two teams, but uh, president of the league shows up and says, kind of, what happened? I kind of explained what, what happened to it. And he looked at me and says, well, I kind of think you did right. It's just too bad he's my dad. <laughs> and then I remember I was coaching at the, the, the uh, little park there in Murrieta. It's still there. And I was the uh, umpire coach. I had a friend that was coming out to visit with me. Irv Winehouse uh, never ever umpired in his life, so I'm umpiring. And at one time between innings, I'm walking to say hi to Irv at the first base coach, and I'm walking by the stands, and some lady says, who is that shitty umpire out there? <laughs> I just stopped. I looked up and said, <laughs> anyway, those are my last two umpiring jobs. I'm going to go back to develop it. It was fun growing up with the community. Then I remember Black, if you see Black's towing out here, I remember he called me one day and said, uh, you know, we need Pop Warner out here. And I was on the Parks Committee at the time, and so we put some money together and some effort. I had this really beautiful Willie's Jeep that I put like five grand into customizing candy apple red and was really happy with it. Well, I put it up for auction um, at $100 a ticket. We got 10000 for this thing. I had five grand into it. And that got our whole Pop Warner League going and actually paid for 23 kids to go over to Hawaii to play a Hawaiian wow. team that hadn't been beaten in five years. Our little Temecula team, not only being undefeated locally, ended up beating this Hawaiian team. So that was a great experience for the local cool. community. 
Um, I don't know how many of you remember Jeannie, uh, um, Bob and Jeannie. Um, they were real involved in community theater, Bob and Jeannie Burns. Um, I was really committed with, uh, with the theater itself. Uh, we, we always financially supported it. You know, I mean, I was really involved in youth sports, frankly, early, and I still am. But somehow the community thing kind of got to my heart because a lot of these kids aren't athletically inclined, and yet the arts are important. And as we found out as the decades go on, you can't get the government to support the arts and the schools to do it. So it's, it's become a real lack there. So we've always taken a real big interest in that. So I've helped uh, involved in, in that particular organization. In 19, I think, uh, probably 85, I went to a play. We were building a, a building, and they were using the building was under construction to do a play. And uh, there was one lady starring in there. Her name was Beverly Heim. Didn't know who she was, but she was starring. I found out later on because she's now my wife. But uh, um, uh, so we got involved in that a lot. In 19, oh, um, what year was that? Make sure I don't get too far off of the facts here. About 1999, uh, Beverly and I had, uh, or I guess before that, uh, um, I decided I wanted to take some dance lesson. I met this gentleman named John Lasko that was out here that did a lot of exhibits and dancing, and he was quite, oh, there's my wife right there. I'll be darned. I just, perfect timer. I just tell him about the story. So. Anyway, so I called John up and said, John, I'm, I'm, I'd like to do some ballroom dancing. Are you interested? And he said, sure. So I brought six of my good buddies and their wives over, and I wasn't dating at the time. I didn't want to date at the time. I wanted to prove to myself I could not date and, and still be happy. Um, so I invited my stepmother to be my date, and John shows up with this nice, beautiful little blonde, and, which I think is, is his dance partner. I assume it's his girlfriend also. So we took lessons after about six or seven lessons. Now, the way I do lessons is, is the right way. We dance for an hour, we drink for an hour, we eat for an hour. So uh, it was a party, but we, we had a lot of fun taking dance lessons. I had a great stepmother, um, but Beverly was more fun to dance with than him because she could, she could lead me or follow my, uh, me without me stepping on her toes. So we danced a lot, but strictly platonic because, again, I thought she was John's girlfriend. Well, after about couple months I called John and said oh, I'm ready to date why don't you set me up with one of these gals that you know likes to dance and we'll go and, and go dancing he said hey why don't you take Beverly I said she's your girlfriend no you never date your dance partner that, that'd be suicide <laughs> so he got a date Betty Lou and Betty Lou is another local person she owned compliments and complaints she's been in business out here for 30 years absolute amazing phenomenal lady her husband Sandy owned the little little book house and uh, yeah, the what Little professor. There you go. Little professor, yeah. Anyway, so uh, so uh, Betty Lou was his date. Well, I spent all day, all night dancing with Betty Lou. I didn't want to dance with Beverly because I was just, she was too good of a dancer for me. But anyway, one thing led to another. Um, we're now dance partners. And the coup de grace of everything is we learned how to do the Viennese waltz. And so we worked hard at it. We went to the the concert in San Diego where they do the Viennese waltzes all night and they're rolling costume in this wow. orchestra, symphony orchestra is there. And the dance cost every night beat John and his and his his date that night. So that was a, that was fun. But I give Betty I truly will give Beverly credit for I work real hard at she does it naturally, but it was it was fun. Um, nineteen ninety, I mean I had we, we were making a lot of money out here. Boy, if you just had to be in the real estate business and have guts, you amassed a, a tremendous net worth. I think I had a net worth of maybe $50 million. A lot of it in real estate, not very much of it in cash, which is the real estate development business. And all of a sudden, 1989, we had a crash. Next thing you know, my value of net worth became zero, which was pretty devastating. But um, it was perfect timing to marry Beverly because she was a good positive supporter. <laughs> so we rode that cycle for a while. Fortunately, we held on to a, a decent part of our land because um, I, I think at that point in time, up to that point in time for the first 20 years I was in business, if I said it once, I said it a thousand times. One thing I like about California real estate, it goes up in good times and stays flat in bad times. That didn't happen in the 1990s. It literally went down in half. The SNL business went upside down. Remember, we closed a lot of uh, uh, government bases at that point in time, and the economy really, really got hit. 
uh, as they closed all these bases down and the SNLs went out of business, federal government created this organization called the Resolution Trust, RTC as it was known. And so they were auctioning this stuff off. Well, I put a little partnership together to, to bid on uh, the, uh, the Great American, which was a big bank in San Diego. They had a portfolio. They were taken over by the uh, federal government. They put all these lands. There was 39 different projects that they were going to sell. My group ended up being the highest bidder. And I, mean, I was bidding against the Bass Brothers and Colonies and you name it, some big money. But we bid 22 cents on the dollar, and, and we were the highest bidder. We won it. And uh, some of the projects, you wouldn't know they're in San Diego, but Copper Canyon right across from Bear Creek was one of the projects that we actually bought for a million and a half as part of that pool. It was a $300 million note pool. Um, with the million and a half that we paid, we got the 700 acres and we got a million dollar CD, which we eventually converted back in cash. So basically we paid 500 grand. Um, Got it all approved the city of Murrieta, had a nice master plan community, had a beautiful golf course designed out there, and some guy named Gary Bryant, who was Dick Gibbo's wife's, oh thanks, Dick Gibbo's wife, son, who had, I'd had him over to my house, because I always have a lot of people over for, for Christmas parties, well I guess the second time he came, I didn't remember that he came a year earlier, so I guess he thought I snubbed him or whatever the case is. So he put this group together uh, to fight this project, and he made the comment to the group, yeah, he doesn't remember who I am, he'll remember me now. So I had this project that we paid 500 grand, sold for 7 or 8 million, and he stopped the sale, and it took us two years to seven lawsuits. Wow. We won every single one of the lawsuits. And I wanted to then send him a, a dozen roses and a box of chocolate because by the time we got everything sold, we sold for $28 million. <laughs> I never did that because I figured he'd sue me thinking the chocolate was bad. But, uh, and he was a shirt, shirt team relative, so that was sort of interesting. But it was interesting, though, because communication is so important. He got all these 35 or 40 people riled up of how we were messing up the environment and this shouldn't be what it was going to be. And... Um, made a lot of statements that were interesting, uh, and that's basically what, what stopped the project. I just said, hey guys, why don't I meet with all these people? If I'm doing anything you don't want, I won't do it. Uh, I guess we had 34 homes we were gonna put on the side of the hill. Um, you know, in hindsight, probably shouldn't have done it. The minute I find that was a problem, great, we'll scrap it. They said, well, you're gonna turn this thing right across from Bear Creek into a commercial center. I said, guys, I'm not, it makes no sense for commercial. You could put a gas station. Zone for a gas station, but they don't want to do it. What do you guys want? Well, we want you to make it residential. Great, I'll make it, I'll make it residential. So, I mean, it was simple. After my third meeting with the group, the only three people who were showing up from that point forward was Gary, his wife, and this one other lady. So uh, we turned everybody around. It's just a matter of communicating. Thought we had done it on the front end. Obviously, we didn't do as good a job as we should have. So uh, anyway, now that's a... Beautiful community. We never got the golf course built because the people we ended up selling it to didn't want to do a golf course, but uh, they built some nice residential community out there. Um, then uh, 2000 came about. We did a lot of little commercial developments in 2000. Um, I remember I built Village Walk, which is a 314,000 square foot power center right there. Cal me and Interstate 15, and um, this is the this is the front door of Murrieta, and so I really wanted to make it nice. That's my community as well as it is everybody else's that lives in Murrieta. I probably spent 150 thousand in extra landscaping just so it was really cool. I never forget when Kelly Serrato, who's now one of our local assemblymen, it was on city council at the time when it was all done and said he said, "Wow, this is nicer than I thought it was going to be." I went, oh. "Well, anyway," and then they let. Uh, then they let a, 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 a car wash with these big arms sitting right there across from City Hall. I want to look up and say, went through a lot of time and effort to try to make it something special. Too bad they didn't get the message and carry it through, but that happens more times than you want to admit. But um, I always had the philosophy, I still have the philosophy, um, you want to build something today, you can come back 20 years later and be proud of the fact that you built it. And um, uh, I have to say, if we've done 350 projects, 
probably only one project I ever did I wish I hadn't done, and it was only four houses in Elsinore. My partner was cheap on the way he built them. Won't give you what his name was, but uh, so it was, wasn't quite the quality I want, but it was about that big of a project compared to what we've done. But the rest of them, we've done a nice job. Um, we bought 153 acres out there on Interstate 10 in, in Waterman Avenue, built what's even today. We did that back in 80. It was totally raw land. It's a million and a half square feet of, of restaurants and, and uh, office buildings and child care centers and heliports and uh, Santa Fe railroad stations. Uh, really a nice project and I still think it's probably one of the best master planned communities in the Inland Empire. And uh, we, were, uh, we built that basically from 19... 86 to about uh, 1996, totally built that project out and had a lot of fun doing it. Um, then in 2007, um, um, Eni Callaway, to, to go, go back a little bit, Eni, who was the chairman of the board of, uh, of Burlington Industry, um, decided to make an investment out in Temecula, eventually ended up assembling about a thousand acres out here, built Callaway Vineyards, uh, made put this place on the map in regards to the Chardonnay that he he marketed all throughout the country um, and, and got a lot of publicity. He was an amazing, a uh, good promoter in that regards. Well, he eventually sold his uh, his holdings to Hiram Walker, who a number of years later sold it to Allied de Mecca, which is a French company, and they managed all the vineyards out here for a number of years until the late 1990s when we got this Pierce's disease out here and about half the vineyards in Temecula, you know, uh, uh, started to die and were affected very severely. And, the city of Temecula, the county of Riverside, Ben Drake, who God bless his soul has passed away since then, really got on the bandwagon, got federal and state and city funding, and basically solved that problem. Um, anyway, Allied Demeca, as a result of that, decided to sell their 1,000 acres. One of their developer bought 600 and some odd acres of it. We ended up buying 330 acres that we now call Europa Village. Um, so that was a, a fun thing for us to do. Um, Europa Village itself is broken into two phases. I got this uh, shirt on here. One of them is 45 acres, which we are building. Um, the, in my opinion, one of the most spectacular wine resorts in the world. Uh, we're building a whole European village, which uh, will include the three great uh, wine regions of Europe, French, Spanish, and English. We've, uh, French, Spanish, and Italian, excuse me. Um, English is famous for their food. I'm sorry about that. No, I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody's been in England. He knows that joke. <laughs> anyway, uh, we finished the Spanish resort. Um, uh, we were voted three days or four days ago the number one winery in the in yeah. Temecula by the Wine Growers Association. So I'm proud of that. Um, our restaurant was voted the number two restaurant in the Inland Empire, and only being open for six months, we were. Disappointed that it was number one, to be honest. Um, no, we're happy with number two to start with. I'm kidding. Um, and our bed and breakfast for the last four years has been devoted to number one bed and breakfast in the Inland Empire. So we're making a statement out there. We're having a lot of fun doing it. Um, I laugh every once in a while because I've done maybe 350 projects out here. I've, I'll guarantee you 20 years after I'm dead, nobody's going to know anything about the self-storage or the industrial buildings or the office building. They're only going to know about Europa Village, so we better not screw this thing up because it's a long, a long life commitment to this community of developing quality things and, again, adding to uh, what we're doing out here. And uh, that's probably where we're going to be remembered by, so certainly committed to that. Um, another thing we're doing a little bit, uh, uh, wine country is, uh, is severely lacking hotel rooms. Uh, so we just started to do a little bit of these vacation rentals out there on larger lots. Temecula's has passed an ordinance you're not allowed to do vacation rentals, which frankly makes a lot of sense because you don't want to party right next to you if you're on a tract home. Uh, wine country is a lot larger spaces, so there's room to do that in certain areas. Um, so we're going to do that. So what's my legacy? And I think the reason that maybe Rebecca asked me to speak tonight, I, uh, we, we received a nice award at the Chamber of Commerce uh, um, a couple, three or four months ago, and uh, one of the things I, I, I try to drive home, because I'm one of the, the last Mohicans, I'm hoping I have another 40 last Mohicans, is, is uh, they master plan this is a country community, and nobody's done that before. Uh, not to the magnitude of what Rancho California was designed, now we call it Temecula. 
And so I want us all to remember that and preserve what we've got out here. Someone talked about the horse country and, and uh, the, the vineyards and, and, and all those things. I, I'm, I, the idea was you can live in the city and in two minutes you can be in the country, whether you're hiking up on La Cresta or Santa Rosa or the Cleveland National Forest or, or riding your bicycle around wine country. This is an amazing country community that the foundation was set by Hugh Blue, Jim Marar, and Hal Lynch back in 1964-65, and I bought into it, I've lived in it, I've supported it, and I can't tell you how many people, times people would come up and said, hey, we want to break this thing down and do tract homes in part of the country area, will you help us? Because um, I have made a lot of friends politically, because I support them and we do good quality projects. I look at them with a smile and I says, I'm not only not going to help you, I'm going to be the first in line to preserve it. And, I, and, and believe me, for the rest of our lives, people are going to continue to ping on that and to try to, to do nothing but make this thing a sea of houses, because that's how developers that maybe don't care about growing a community think. And, uh, and I don't, and I know you in this room do not, and so we've got we've to make sure we carry that legacy going forward. So I think I've probably spent enough time talking. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes. So have, have we preserved the 2080? Is the what? Have we preserved the 2080 ratio? What do you think it is? I think we've preserved the 20 acre ratio, uh, if not 100%, pretty doggone close to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they've done a great job. Good. So, uh, you know, but way back, um, I think Beverly Hills was the first master planned community. Uh, a long time ago, there was no rules and regulations. I went to USC. I took every real estate course I could take. It totaled three. Okay, now there's probably 30 or maybe more than that, to be very frank. So urban planning has become far more sophisticated. Um, the, um, you know, having to do general plans now and specific plans and zoning, three years and hundreds of thousands to do what you do in three weeks and, ten, and thousands of dollars has made it more difficult and people are paying a lot more attention to the stores. So um, as a company, other than doing self-storage and a few things like that, I'm not doing land development anymore. It has gotten to be a pain in the butt. And, uh, and it's too it's too unpredictable. You were a civil engineer. It used to be fun. It's no fun anymore. Uh, and they just change the rules and regulations. And when you're halfway through it, and add time and money to every project you do. So, and we're good at it, but we're basically out of the business. I'm just I'm doing a lot of self storage. These vacation rentals I like. Totally committed to Europa Village to make that thing special for us and our investors in the community. But that's where I'm at. So. Any other comments, sir? Hi. Hi. When will Europa Village be completed? Europa Village is going to, is going to be completed eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> One of those things. Um, yeah, I think it's going to last as long as I live. But, uh, um, you know, the challenge is when we first started doing it, we end up into that recession in 2007. I had amassed a net worth that was four times what I did in the 90s. That went back down to zero. So, I mean, I had land that we were, it was worth 83000 a lot that became worth minus. 5,000 a lot. I mean, it just, it just evaporated. Fortunately, I kept on to some of it, so I'm never going to be worth what I was, but I'm going to be worth enough where I can do what I want. But uh, an interesting roller coaster when you, when you get into that. Anyway, we, we, we put that together in 2006. The idea was to build it over the next seven years. Uh, in 2009, I went back to my investors. I've been around long enough. This is, guys, we're not doing anything until this recession's over. Me thinking it was going to be three or four years. Not, it took 10 years for the real estate market out here to lift its head back up and start breathing because there was so much overbuilding between 2000 and 2007. So we basically put it on hold. Fortunately, we decided to build this little prelude to get us started. In hindsight, it was great because this is a new venture for us. So it gave us a chance to crawl just get our wine set up to get our event coordination to get my management put together we have 47 Denver variety so it was an opportunity to sell and get a base we bought that little low Melissa bed and breakfast people that owned that were friends of mine they had they didn't market it very well they were running at 20 percent occupancy uh, the bank was foreclosing on them they filed bankruptcy well I was playing golf with the president of the bank and I said hey are you interested in selling me the note and they would like 2.2 million, their note was for a million. 
And so I ended up negotiating with him. I bought it for 800 Before I did that, I went to the people and said, hey, if I give you 25 grand cash so you can move to Arizona, what you want to do, will you eliminate your bankruptcy? And they said, you betcha. <laughs> so I, they got 25 grand. The bank got 800 We got this beautiful asset. So we ran that for a, a long period of time. Originally, we were going to build all of Europe at once. Um, just the change in the world and what have you. We decided to do it in bits and pieces. So we built the Spanish which has now been completed just perfect timing right when COVID hit. <laughs> so we limped along, losing a little bit of money, not, a, not an amazing amount. Kept all of our staff, which I was really excited about because we got a great staff, uh, very frankly. And, um, and then some, April of this year, as COVID wound down, we started turning a profit, and now we're turning a nice profit, so it's moving in the right direction. Uh, the Italian, because right now, because of this COVID and, and the challenge financing major hotels, is basically there's no funds available. We decided to break the Italian component into two pieces. We officially broke ground on the, uh, on the land about a week ago. We hope to break ground on the building uh, come January, and we're going to build the 27,000 square foot winery part of it, which is the catering kitchen, 15,000 events center, the farm to table Italian market, and a bunch of other components to it, and not build the hotel until that's done. So we're breaking that into two phases. And then shortly thereafter, we'll do the, say, uh, the French say la vie. Answer your long answer to your question, probably three or four years before we get it all built. All generated by just financing and capital. But so what is the restaurant now that is that just what? opened six months ago? It's what? The restaurant that just opened six months ago there? Bolero? Yeah. What is it Spanish food then? Spanish? Well, you know what? Yes, it is. It's a tapas style, style restaurant. Um, so a lot of shared stuff. However, you can order your sea bass or your steak or a lot of stuff. If you feel like you want any steak that big all by yourself, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, and we've got an amazing, phenomenal chef. And... Uh, um, if you haven't been there, I, I have not I'm had going. anybody that hasn't been there that just said, wow, this is the best yeah. in the valley, and that's our commitment to make it the best in the valley. So, hard, but look, the good news, a little bit hard to get into, so you got to make reservations. So. She's going to win yeah. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Do you have concerns about the water for all the development that's going in? We see a lot of it, especially to the east of us, and it looks like there's so many more new homes coming in. Just wonder... With the drought that we have, what do you think about the water situation? Uh, I used to give a different answer to that question than I'll give now. I'm more, more concerned right now than I, than I used to, but there's a couple of things that a lot of people don't quite realize. It. One thing that Kaiser Retina did back in the early 64, 65 years, they created their own independent water district called Rancho California Water District. Um, and underneath the Valley de los Caballos and the Mesa Grande, there's a reservoir that's twice as big as Valley, huge underground water s s source. And they fill that up with inexpensive water during the winter, um, both from Feather River Project and from uh, different water sources they have out here. So they maintain that. Then they end up buying Vail Lake, and then they teamed up with Eastern Municipal and, uh, and, M and, M and Met for Lake Skinner. Uh, and the Dominic Parkway, so they've done a phenomenal job managing the water. Um, and then you have to add up the fact that, and this is another reason I'm not in the land development business, good for water preservation, bad for a developer. Um, we built, when I say we, the community built hundreds of millions of dollars worth of storm drain systems when it rains to take water down the storm drain. Now we don't, they're not allowed to use it. You now have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars keeping the water on your site. So there's all kinds of things you have to do to keep water on your site so it goes back down into, into the system. In all of wine country right now, if, and this is where Rancho California has seen a lot of growth because there's a sewer system there. If you're not on Rancho California, you're on De Patola or Camino de Vina or some of these other side streets, there's no sewer. You can't do hotels because they want to preserve the quality of the water systems up in there. So they've done a great job managing it. Um, it's always going to be an issue until we figure out how Northern California, who has ample supply of water, figures a distribution system to get it down here. Uh, whether that will ever happen, who knows. But uh, So they are not only have done a good job managing what they have, they're making it where it's, uh, you got to preserve water much more as time goes on. But still one of the issues you have to deal with. Thank you. So. Very good.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.